Thank you so much, Vincent, for inviting me and thanks everyone else for, for being here. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about what I call the triangulation approach or how to get rid of confounds in neuroscience. And I should I should warn everyone that the title that I sent Bense had a couple uh, typos. Uh, it should have been more something like this. How to try to get rid of as many confounds as possible in neuroscience. In other words, uh, I just want to temper everyone's expectations. Uh, it's in a in a way, it's it, it's a rather humble project that uh, I want to share with you and see see what people think. Um, as everyone knows, uh, getting rid of um, confounds in in science in general, it's one of the main challenges that uh, researcher faces when uh, designing their experiment. And I think neuroscience uh, raises particular challenge challenges that, that we need to to deal with. And and this is just a um, a proposal of how to start thinking about those things. Okay, so. Let me start. Our minds can do a lot of things. Uh, we can perceive the world, we can remember uh, events, we feel emotions, we have thoughts, and so many other uh, mental states and capacities populate our minds. And cognitive neuroscience uh, tries to explain how those faculties or those mental states are implemented by the brain. And the idea is, at least, you know, uh, prima facie should be really straightforward. You have a mental state and you have a neural state and you find out, uh, uh, and you try to find out uh, which neural state, uh, neural state uh, 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 supports every kind of mental state. And for doing this, uh, you try to find uh, all sorts of uh, correspondences or correlations between when someone is in a particular mental state and when someone is in a particular neural state. And for the rest of the talk, I will use mental state and neural state generally, but of course I mean mental capacity or it, it might be a mental process or a mental event or a mental property. Um, and the same for neural states. I, I might talk about neural states, but I, I might talk about like what I mean is like the neural substrate or the correlates or uh, neural activity or the neural networks or the neural processes that support those mental states. Um, so let me start with a very simple example. Uh, let's say you want to know how we perceive beauty. What is it in the brain? How does the brain uh, appreciate beauty? And well, one thing you could do is put someone in an, FMR, on an MRI scanner and measure their neural activity in real time and you present something beautiful to them and they tell you that yep what they're seeing is a beautiful thing and then you see what their um, neural activity looks like uh, which might be something like this and of course this is uh over simplistic in part because we don't have access to mental state directly we have to um already ask subjects what their behavior is and maybe find some indirect physiological marker and so on. Uh, but we don't have access to mental states. We only have access through uh, reports from subjects or some other sort of behaviors. And moreover, there is no one-to-one -one mapping between mental states and neural states. Uh, it's rather a many-to-many -many relationship that it exists between mental states, neural states, and behaviors, which is the way we know about these mental states. So, for example, the same behavior can be produced by very different mental states, or the same mental state may produce very different behaviors in different contexts. And the same is true for behavior in neural states or uh, mental states that might be implemented by different neural states, or the same neural state may produce different mental states given certain context and, and another sort of condition. So it's rather complicated to do this mapping, as probably everyone in this uh, uh, room knows. And so the thing is like, if you want to look for beauty, uh, really there are lots of confounds that uh, you might uh, face when trying to understand how beauty is implemented by the brain. For example, uh, beauty and pleasure may correlate a lot, or every time you see something beautiful, it might be correlated with uh, how famous it is. For example, in the case of 
maybe an actor or uh, works of art. And uh, maybe value it's confounded to. In the case of the Mona Lisa, that's pretty obvious. Uh, if you see something, if you think the Mona Lisa is beautiful, you might be evaluating also that it is very valuable or it has some historical uh, importance. And the problem is that when you instantiate all these uh, mental states, when you see the Mona Lisa, you also might instantiate many different neural states. And if, if that happens, when you you know, use some neuroimaging tool or EEG or whatever uh, uh, tool you have at your disposal, uh, when you see the neural activity, it's very hard to know if that neural activity belongs to the beauty part of experiencing the Mona Lisa or the pleasure that you derive from it and so on. So a real challenge in neuroscience is to deconfound uh, how we collect data or how we uh, run our experiments such that only the uh, mental state of interest is available because otherwise we really can't know what its neural state or neural uh, implementation is. So enter the subtraction method. It's a very popular, uh, maybe the most popular approach in neuroimaging to trying to figure out what exactly the neural activity pertaining to a particular mental state is. Uh, again, mental state, capacity, event, whatever. Um, it's not the only one, but it's very popular in, in neuroimaging, like in fMRI or EEG and so on. And it works, again, very, uh, it's just a toy example, but it works in the following way. You uh, show someone something beautiful, they tell you that it's beautiful, you measure their neural activity while they're doing that, and you contrast that with something that doesn't have that property, something that, uh, in this case, it's not beautiful. Uh, but of course, these um, uh, uh, very interesting poodles are uh, very different from the Mona Lisa. So one thing you want to do is match as closely your control condition, the one that you're going to contrast your uh, condition of interest from. So perhaps you go with uh, Duchamp and use a picture of the Mona Lisa, but you know, like the goatee and the mustache might make you think like, oh, the, you know, this image is ruined, it's really not beautiful anymore. And if you measure brain activity at the same time, you can basically get the brain activity pertaining to experiences of beauty, and you can subtract that brain activity uh, from uh, experience, mental uh, neural activity pertaining to experiences of non-beautiful things. And basically what remains uh, should be the neural correlates of the experience of beauty, let's say. This is very straightforward. Uh, this is, of course, a toy example, but it's actually not that far from what neuroscientists do in terms of contrasting uh, uh, neural activity of two different conditions. Uh, so to say the same thing in a slightly different way, when you see the Mona Lisa, you implement many different mental states, some of which are beauty, but some of which are confounds. And for the same reason, some different neural states are uh, instantiated. And when you something that, let's assume uh, you don't find these, uh, your subjects don't find these Duchamp beautiful, when you see something uh, that it's not beautiful, you might, the idea is to find something that instantiates exactly all the other compounds, right? Like fame and the cost and uh, the pleasure derived from seeing thing, except for the mental uh, state of target, uh, 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 the target mental state, in this case, beauty. And so when you uh, obtain two different uh, neural states, you can subtract one from another, and basically they can cancel each other out, uh, leaving only the target mental state of interest and the neural activity of interest surviving. And therefore, uh, you know, if everything goes to plan, you can say that you found the neural correlates of uh, the experience of beauty. This is a very basic toy example, of course. Um, but this is wh what scientists do. This is what we try to do when trying to find the neural correlates of whatever, beauty, memory, emotions, and so on. And of course, you know, neuroscientists are uh, uh, use way more sophisticated methods, but this is uh, like a backbone of uh, the way uh, some of these uh, studies are done. But of course, this is too good to be true, even in the toy example world. Uh, there are differences between these two 
conditions, right? When you see the Mona Lisa, there are no, there's no mustache, but when you see the Duchamp, there's no mustache. So those two states can't be already identical. So when you perform the subtraction, something will be added or left uh, without canceling. Um, and this is, of course, true for the other properties, the other mental states that these uh, seeing these images might trigger. Uh, none of them are perfectly matched for beauty or lack thereof. So, for example, the Duchamp on the right might, you know, it might still be beautiful to some extent. And it's, of course, uh, not equally famous, and maybe you don't derive exactly the same pleasure, and uh, it's definitely not equally valuable. So uh, it's really hard to match perfectly between two conditions such that the subtraction really truly only leaves the uh, mental state and therefore the neural state of interest. So the plan for today is to elaborate on this abstraction method uh, and raise uh, in a little bit more detail some of its challenges. And in this section of the talk, uh, the, the first section, I will I will give like a very general overview of the subtraction method, right? I'm going to talk about how uh, it works in the abstract, as it were. Uh, and in the second section, I will discuss a case study, uh, the neural correlates of consciousness, which is something I've worked on before. And hopefully it will be like a salient example of what's uh, problematic or what challenges the subtraction method faces. But hopefully, too, uh, the lessons that we derive from, from studying this particular case can be extended to any other uh, construct of interest. It's, there's, there's nothing I will say today, or very little of what I will say today, that it will be um, specific about consciousness, even though I will use it as an example. Uh, this is something that, at least in my mind, affects uh, basically all neuroscience research, or neuroimaging in humans, at least. Um, so I will, I will talk about the importance of matching for test performance in order to eliminate uh, the largest amount of confidence possible. And I will raise uh, some worries about the limitations of this approach. And finally, in the last section, I will bring up the triangulation approach, which is, it's going to be rather humble, right? So as I said before, I, I, I wish, um, uh, with, I want to temper the expectations of the audience. Um, it's rather simple what I have to propose today. Uh, and yet, I don't think it's something that it's done that much in neuroscience. And therefore, I, I think that it's a worth, it's, it's an approach that it's worth considering in order to tackle the problems that uh, confounds in neuroscience rates. And the work that I'm going to present today uh, was uh, thought out in collaboration with uh, Brian Ryan Scalco and Brian Odegaard also known as the Bryans. And I, I have to say that, you know, everything that you think is great was because of these guys and, you know, everything that you think doesn't work, it's probably my fault. Um, so uh, I just want to acknowledge their collaboration, but I'm, I'm going a little bit beyond what uh, we work on together. So uh, I, I can be held responsible for uh, anything you disagree with. Okay, so let's talk about the subtraction method. This is, I'm just going to say again, something that I said before, but in a little bit more detail. The idea is that uh, when you try to find the neural correlates of a particular psychological variable, what you do is you try to record neural activity during the condition of interest. So a condition in which subjects experience the psychological variable of interest or token that uh, psychological variable, for example, the experience of beauty or being conscious versus not being conscious or remembering something versus forgetting something and so on. And you also record the neural activity during a control condition where the psychological variable psi is absent, right? Like ideally everything is the same except for uh, the presence of that psychological variable. And because everything is meant to be the same, except for the psychological variable of interest, you can subtract the neural activity elicited by the control condition from the neural activity elicited by the condition of interest. And by subtraction, I mean something very literal, right? Like this is a very quantitative method. Uh, if you think about fMRI, you can have some bold activity. So you have voxels that, uh, you know, have a particular value that correspond to uh, um, 
uh, a bold measure uh, that fMRI can can extract. And the idea is if that voxel has a value of 0.7 and during the condition of interest and the voxels in the control condition has a, um, a value of 0.5, you literally subtract that and you know the 0.2 that remains, it's, uh, it's supposed to be corresponding to only the condition of interest. Uh, so it's a literal subtraction that I mean. And Again, as with everything that I will say today, everything is more complicated. There are uh, uh, lots of corrections. In the case of EEG, it's uh, you know you're you're subtracting something that it's less uh, uh, obviously like a value as I just described. But basically, the idea is this. And the why the, the the reason why the subtraction method is meant to work is that if the only difference between the two conditions is psi, the, the psychological variable of interest then the remaining neural activity is the neural correlates of that psychological uh, variable, or at least one of the neural correlates of that psychological variable of interest. Um, and I should say, like, if there are questions in, 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 in the middle, like, you should feel free to uh, interrupt or ask me any question. Um, okay. I'll continue, but feel free to interrupt. Okay, so there are many challenges for this method. Uh, the condition should be maximally matched and still create a psychological difference, right? Like otherwise the subtraction method is imperfect. And in other words, everything except for psi should be identical between the conditions. That's the, that's the ideal subtraction that uh, we should aim for. But of course, one, one may wonder, like, what, what is everything in this context, right? What does it count as? Uh, what, what we should count in this everything? What's the scope of, of this uh, quantifier? Uh, on one hand, it's the stimulation, right? Like the, the, the actual stimulation, uh, you know, the words that are to be remembered, the works of art that are to be appreciated, the Gabor patches that are to be discriminated, and so on, should be uh, I, identical uh, between conditions. The task itself should be the same. Uh, the behavioral measures that we obtain uh, from the task, like reaction times or accuracy and so on, ideally should be identical. And this is crucial, of course, this is the most important, this is basically the reason why we do the subtraction method. All the non-relevant or non-targeted psychological variables should be identical, right? Like if you're trying to discover the neural correlates of uh, beauty, fame, pleasure, value, etc., should be matched. And in a way, the non-relevant neural activity should be matched too, right? Like anything that the brain does that doesn't pertain to the psychological variable of interest should be identical between the target and the control conditions. And stimulation and task are relatively under experimenter's direct control or basically almost under experimenter's direct control. Uh, you can change the number of stimuli, the duration in which you present that, the properties that they have, like the contrast or whether it's masked or not, or at what, uh, whether you present it at threshold uh, for a particular participant and so on. And the same for the task, you can control what subjects do. Um, but the behavioral measures and the psychological and neural variables are really only on their indirect control, um, increasingly so to a large extent, like the behavioral measures, like you might try to control for it, maybe by thresholding, or you can you can set up your task such that accuracy is more or less the same across conditions. Um, but the non-relevant psychological variables, it's really hard to control for. Like your task is supposed to control for them, but it will do it in a, in a very uh, indirect way. And the same for the uh, strenuous neural activity. So, and here's the challenge. Uh, any changes that you make in the stimulation or the task it, are meant to create a difference in the, in tokening the psychological variable of interest and uh, its absence, right? The problem is that every time you change the stimulation or the task to create this difference, right? You, you, you have to change you have to put the 
the Mona Lisa with the mustache and the goatee in order for maybe disrupt its beauty. But once you do that, um, you also change other variables, right? Uh, that you don't want to change. You want to keep them as similar as possible. Um, and the problem with these is, of course, that it might seem that it's impossible to have a perfect subtraction method, um, or at least it's extremely hard, because there has to be some difference, right, in stimulation and task in order to create you know, in order in one condition to token the psychological variable and in another condition to not token it. But you also want that everything remains the same. Uh, it's almost like wanting to uh, eat your cake and have it. So what can we do? Um, let me elaborate a little bit more on the problem. Um, so on the, this uh, tough we have on the x-axis differences in task and stimulation, right? The more you change the task and the stimulation, and on the y-axis, I'm plotting the differences in non-relevant psychological variables, which is what we really, really, really want to make sure stays the same. And of course, you can make sure that there are no differences in psychological variables, but that means that uh, you can't make any changes or there, there can't be any differences in the task and, and stimulation. And to some extent, there might be like a monotonic increase or maybe, maybe it's not monotonic, but, but there's a correlation in the more difference you introduce in task and stimulation, the more differences you introduce in psychological variables, which is something you want to avoid. But the problem is that all, you know, the more differences in task and stimulation that you introduce, the more different, the more likely uh, your control condition and your uh, target condition are going to be ideal. And the least differences you introduce in task and stimulation, the less likely your control and target conditions are going to vary in the relevant dimension, in the tokening of the psychological vari uh, variable of interest psi. So it's almost like it's an impossible task. Like if, if you see this this uh, graph in this space, it's just impossible to remain on this part of the graph while also uh, having a clearly different psychological difference. So what you want to do is to maximize the differences in psi and not and not not psi in the target and control conditions while matching for confounds as much as possible. So you're you're trying to get differences in task and stimulation and have perhaps this curve shape where um, you can introduce the most task and stimulation differences without creating uh, lots of differences in non-relevant psychological variables. But as you can tell, it will be imperfect, right? It will create some difference in psychological variables, uh, uh, variables and there will be some differences in task and stimulation. And the difference between psi and not psi is not going to be as marked as it could be. So basically, this is a compromise. And uh, more or less around this region is where uh, you want to design your experiments. But um, of course, it's imperfect. So uh, there are too many psychological variables that are not matched. And um, you will also have stimulation and test differences. So here's a proposal. Um, it's two steps, right? It will it will require two steps. Step number one, match behavioral measures that increase likelihood of matching several underlying non-relevant uh, hidden psychological variables. And two, uh, triangulate results from different experimental designs with disjoint set of confounds into one overarching analysis. And of course, uh, rather than eliminating, as I said before, this is a humble approach. So uh, we're going to try to minimize the confounds as much as we can. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to elaborate on these two steps, uh, on why matching behavioral measures that increase likelihood of matching underlying variables is important and how to do it in the particular case of conscious experiences. And the step two, how to triangulate these results. And uh, when I talk about these, I'm going to, you know, the triangulation part, it's going to be it's pretty straightforward, as I said. It's it's in a way a humble approach, but it's also it's not just a technical approach. It will have a sociological component, if you like, uh, in in how we do science. Uh, 
and how, wh what we think as successful science. And um, I'm going to end the talk by uh, elaborating on those ideas. So maybe this is a good place for uh, stopping and see if there are any questions or comments. Any questions, comments, anyone? I thought it was crystal clear so far, so. Yeah, okay, great. So I move on to uh, a particular case study of the neural, uh, where I, I'll, I'll focus on the neural correlates of consciousness as, as an example of how to match for confounds. So when you do uh, consciousness research, the idea is you show subjects some stimulus. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on visual consciousness, but it could be done with other modalities as well. And the idea is that subjects see that stimulus, they experience it consciously, and while they're undergoing that experience, you measure their brain activity. And you know, you know that they experience it because basically they, they tell you right, that, that they saw the stimulus, and they don't have to verbally report it. It could be a bottom press or 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 you know, some other type of nonverbal measure. And then you have a control condition where you present ideally the exact same stimulation, but subjects are not aware of it. And, you know, you know that they're not aware of it because they tell you. Um, and as people probably know, there are a million uh, problems and debates about whether this is the best way or what problems they arise and whether subjects can really report having seen something or not without any bias and so on. But again, this is a toy example, so uh, this is good enough. And because presenting exactly the same stimulation and expecting uh, starkly different uh, mental states, like being conscious and unconscious of it, it's hard. Uh, usually, we have to do something to the stimulus. We can mask it, we can threshold it, we can change its duration. We can present it at a particular time that is synced with some brainwave dynamics and so on and so forth, so that the, a, a very similar, albeit not identical, stimulus is uh, creates uh, a condition of unconsciousness. And here, uh, I'm going to talk about phenomenal consciousness, right? Like the, what it's like to see something. Um, and there are a series of potential confounds when trying to measure the brain activity pertaining to phenomenal consciousness. The most obvious one, and uh, there's a huge literature about it, it's report itself, right? So when subjects tell the experimenter that they saw something consciously versus something not consciously, that act of reporting uh, might create some undesired differences. Or perhaps rather than the report itself, it's the introspective act of actually evaluating one's experience and, and you know, trying to think about whether you saw something or not. It's very different uh, what takes place when, when you are actually conscious of the stimulus than when you're not. Uh, working memory and other types of cognitive abilities might be fair. So when you see something consciously, you, you can do many things with it. Right? You can keep it in working memory, you can, uh, uh, think about it, you can make connections with other pieces of knowledge that you have and so on. Whereas when you don't see anything consciously, when you don't see the stimulus consciously, there are many things that you can't do, right? Like you can't discriminate it equally well, you can't keep it in working memory equally well, you, and so on and so forth. So uh, cognition seems to be very different between uh, consciousness and unconsciousness. And, um, you know, related to this text performance, as I said, like what kind of things you can do with, with, you know, the experience, like if you, um, in the laboratory setting, text performance might just be like how many trials you have correct. Like if you see the thing correctly, uh, sorry, consciously, you might also be more likely to quantify it or do the task uh, better. And in the, yeah. I thought there was a question. Um, and in the wild, it's the same, right? In in, in the wild where uh, if you're conscious of seeing something, you might interact with it, you might grab it, you might uh, direct your attention towards it, and so on and so forth. Whereas if you're not aware of something, uh, 
well, the most likely outcome is that you will ignore it and that will create massive differences in your brain state. Okay, so there are some obvious compounds that are easy to eliminate. Uh, take this uh, study by Dehan uh, in 2001, where they showed subjects uh, a hey, work hey, as, as, the, uh, oh, slides. Say again? We can't see the slides anymore. Oh, that's so weird. Uh, did it stop sharing, I guess? Can you see it now? It's back for me now. Yeah, thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Cool. Okay, so I was just saying, uh, I don't think uh, people, I don't, I don't think you lost uh, much. Um, I was just saying that some, some compounds are easy to eliminate. Uh, consider this study by the Han in 2001, where they show subjects two words, uh, sorry, they show subjects either a word or nothing, and they had to uh, basically report, uh, you know, if there was a word present or not. And before the presentation of the word, uh, there was some masks being presented uh, on the screen, and then there was a blank screen that allowed, you know, some buffer such that when the word came up, uh, subjects were able to see that uh, the presentation of that word and then another blank screen and then the masks uh, reappear again. And in the masked condition, uh, the blank and the masks uh, were flipped such that the mask preceded immediately, immediately preceded the, word, the presentation of the word or the blank. And then a mask again appeared right after the presentation of the word. And what this created was that basically subjects couldn't see the word in this case. Like in this condition, they always or almost always reported it uh, not seeing anything. It was the unconscious condition. Whereas in this condition uh, where there was a buffer, uh, subjects were able to detect the word and see it consciously when, when it was present. And of course, as you could imagine, when they looked into the brain, they found uh, a massive difference in brain activity for visible words and masked words, uh, which is what you would expect, except that they actually didn't ask subjects in this experiment to do anything when they didn't see a word. So basically, when the word lion was presented, and they saw it consciously, they had to report it, they had to press a button that indicated that they saw the word. But when the word lion was presented, but it was, or, you know, any word was presented and it was masked such that subjects had no experience of the word, they were, they were not asked to do anything. They basically didn't have to do anything. So, it looks like this is a massive confound because in one case you have to like pay attention if you see something you have to maybe put that information in working memory and actually make like a motor movement and, and make a decision that you have to report whereas in the other case like maybe you're doing a decision making a, a decision as well in terms of not reporting but it's very different right like you're literally eliminating report in one of the conditions creating a massive confound in other words, once you apply the subtraction method, uh, what it might reveal is the neural correlates of consciousness, sure, but also the neural correlates of report, and do not want that. Um, the literature has, uh, this is 20, a 20-year-old 20 paper, the, uh, the, the field has come a long way in trying to match for all these things, but there are still some worries that uh, there are confounds that are more complex to eliminate, even if you match for the actual like pressing of a button kind of reporting, because there might be introspective and working memory and in general, just cognition differences that uh, are just very hard to eliminate between con the conscious and the unconscious condition. And the idea, and there's a massive literature in this, uh, it's that the neural activity that you find in, when you make this subtraction may not be due to difference in awareness, but due to differences in a set of reported related cognitive capacities, right? Where even though you have to report both conscious and unconscious trials, it's really not the same kind of effort or it's really not the same kind of reporting that you're doing. There's still a difference there. So for example, 
um, when subjects report having seen the stimulus or having not seen the stimulus, really the it in, in this cartoon, like I saw it or I didn't see it, um, it does have a very different content, right? Like when you see, when you report having seen something, that's something maybe you're keeping the Gabor patch in working memory, maybe you have an after image, maybe you have a, um, um, you know what you saw and therefore, you know, you could do something with it if you wanted to. Whereas when you don't see something, um, you know, and you try to introspect your experience, it, the outcome is so different, like it comes out blank. It might be harder to introspect like the absence of something that the presence of something, uh, or maybe there's nothing to keep in working memory uh, when, when you don't see consciously something. So it's, you know, there are legitimate reasons to worry about um, differences in report, but to be honest, I think that they are, uh, the report demands are less bad than they sound. Uh, uh, I wrote a uh, recent paper with my friend, uh, Matthias Michel, about these. Uh, on one hand, there is evidence that there is uh, working memory for unconscious stimuli, so unconscious stimulus that are not perceived consciously can still be kept in working memory. There is evidence of silent uh, neural activity that can be then reactivated. So working memory demands might not be as different as uh, initially thought. And in order to do the kind of tasks where you have to report consciousness versus non-conscious uh, experience, you don't, you don't, at least not for every task design, you, you don't have to keep specific information about the stimulus or lack thereof in working memory. So for the most part, you might just say, um, saw something or, you know, you, you can you can just keep in working memory the, the outcome of your introspective report. For example, there was something there or there wasn't anything there. And those two are very similar. You don't have to keep in working memory for doing this task, like the specific information about the stimulus. And just more generally, um, in lots of experiments, what you're judging is how visible or whether the stimulus was visible or not. Um, which again, it's something that doesn't seem to put too much um, of a load on working memory, on cognition, or even what you can do with that uh, experience, right? Like uh, there are hundreds of trials in these experiments, most likely subjects just want to move on to the next stage and they don't need to keep the detailed information in, uh, in working memory. But there are some problems about measuring um, neural activity or, or in the case of fMRI, bold activity, that it's really hard to disentangle what pertains to the conscious experience and what are other types of confounds. In particular, I think there are at least three types of uh, possible confounds. Uh, the pre-processing, the pre-perceptual processing confounds. So for example, there could be differences in the brain state of subjects right before you present stimulation. There could be concurrent processing confounds, like uh, literally the perceptual processing of the stimulus, not its conscious part, but literally the, the processing of the signal, like what's the signal to noise uh, ratio of the stimulation in the conscious versus unconscious condition, and all the processes that visual, uh, our visual system uh, carries out. And then of course, there are post-processing potential confounds. Uh, working memory is one of them. They might not be so important, but there are many of those uh, in cognition that we wanna keep an eye on it. And the problem is that, I mean, an easy, possible solution will be like, well, just measure uh, brain activity while subjects are being stimulated as they are undergoing their conscious experience. But the reality is like, there is no spatial or temporal uh, clear distinctions in, in the brain, uh, especially for stimulations that tend to be like rather brief and bold activity uh, being rather slow. So, for the most part, the pre-stimulus activity that might affect uh, how you see something versus not uh, goes well into the uh, measuring uh, activity, uh, measuring period, right, during the stimulation. Uh, signal uh, feature extraction and other perceptual 
processes might be carried, continue to be carried out afterwards. And definitely some cognitive processes might start as you see the stimulus, right? As you start seeing the stimulus, you might keep it in working memory, you might need to introspect, you might need to do something different from when you see it than when you don't see it consciously. So all this is just to say it's rather complicated. And there was a recent suggestion uh, by Ned Block where he thinks that even the no report paradigm is not is not sufficient, like trying to avoid making reports and going for an indirect measure like physiology or eye gaze or pupil diameter and whatnot. That might not even sufficient because even if you match uh, report, eliminating all post-perceptual cognition is really hard, right? If you're seeing something different, let's say in binocular rivalry, when you are presented with two different stimuli to both eyes, to each eye, uh, which means that you can't experience both uh, uh, percepts at the same time, so you you have some shifts between one and the other, and even in that case where where you know maybe you don't need to do anything, you can you can use some indirect measures to infer when a uh, subject is experiencing one or the other. Uh, Netblock thinks, look, um, there are other things that are going on. You're seeing these uh, stimuli for a, a million times. You might just associate one percept with a particular set of thoughts, and you might associate another percept with another particular set of thoughts, and it could be uh, really hard to make these comparisons. And he suggested uh, an interesting paradigm uh, developed by Brasscamp and colleagues where Basically, the left eye and the right eye in this binocular rivalry paradigm is extremely similar, right? Like it's the same overall uh, stimulus features. They are just dots of the same color moving in a random uh, motion in a very similar way, except that they're not exactly the same, right? Like uh, this dot over here was moving uh, to the right, and this dot over here uh, was moving to the left in the right eye. So they never uh, overlap, and therefore you can have binocular rivalry, except that the transitions are imperceptible to, for the most part, right? Because you just go from experiencing random blue dots moving around to random blue dots moving around, except that uh, at some point your experience comes from one eye, and another point your experience comes from information uh, project into the other eye. And he thinks that this is ex exceptional because then, you know, there's nothing special about each of the two transitions and you can study uh, the brain when, when you're conscious of one stimulus and when you're unconscious of the other. Uh, and there's no cognition that, you know, differs. Um, Ian Phillips and I wrote a reply to these and suggested that, you know, the problem with this is that if you really don't have a stimulation difference or it's so small that it's completely undetected by the subject, then there is really no psychological difference that matters. Uh, in other words, um, you might not uh, notice any changes, uh, which is interesting, but if the stimulation is so similar, you might not actually token very well uh, the psychological difference of interest. And most importantly, you might still have thoughts associated with, uh, you know, one types of motion versus another, which is not, uh, you know, kind of defeats the purpose of these. And to avoid, uh, or this, this leaves us at a, at, a, at a crossroads, which is what's the best way to match for psychological confounds? It could be stimulation, but then if you really match stimulation, you might either find no difference in the psychological variance of interest, as I just mentioned, or as some paradigms do, you might put a stimulus at threshold that is identical uh, for both conditions because, you know, you sometimes see it and you sometimes don't. But that's very hard because you can't control when subjects are going to see it and when not. So it's it's basically you depend on flukes in, 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 in the presentation for creating conscious and unconscious conditions. Uh, you can try to match for pre-stimulation conditions, but this is insufficient and it creates flux as well. It's insufficient for uh, creating conscious and unconscious experiences. You can match for task demands, for example, report, 
uh, and that's okay. We should try to match as much as possible. But again, as I just showed, this doesn't solve the issue because you might still have differences in cognition. You might try to match for psychological states or capacities, but as I said before, we really don't have direct access. So you will, in order to match for this, you will end up trying to match stimulation or tasks, uh, uh, which we already saw it's not uh, useful. And at least for conscious exp uh, experiences, I've proposed for a while that signal pr processing is what we need to aim to match. It can have a ripple effect in cognition that it's the close we can have for matching uh, the psychological states that are non-relevant uh, for doing neuroscience. So let me just elaborate a little bit on this. And this, is already, this already brings us to the step one of the approach that I want to put forward, which is in the case of con consciousness, match performance or match signal processing, but maybe for other constructs like memory or uh, the experience of beauty and so on, really what you want to do is try to match for a behavioral um, measure that has a widespread effect in the rest of uh, the subject's mind. In the case of consciousness, when task performance differs across conscious and unconscious conditions, there are many other things that differ as well, right? Uh, behavior, perceptual, and cognitive capacities. Um, your attention is not the same, right? When you see something consciously, you can attend to it, but not when you're not conscious of it. You might be able to discriminate it better when you see it than when you don't see it consciously. And as I said before, uh, working memory, cognitive control, or even motor control and rational evaluation of the stimulus uh, might be just better in, in conscious experiences in general. But you can avoid this by matching how well subjects can do the task. If the way they process the signal, it's matched between conscious and unconscious trials, um, you might hope that other psychological variables become matched as well, or better match at least. And of course, the only way of knowing that this is working, it's by matching some behavioral measure, in this case, performance, basically how well they can do the task. Uh, this is something that has been attempted before, um, with, uh, I would say, lots of successful examples. Uh, I'll just mention a couple. Uh, Hackman Lau and uh, Dick Passingham a few years ago uh, matched for performance in the presentation of a masked stimulus uh, by varying how uh, close to the stimulus uh, metacontrast mask was presented. So either right after or a little bit before the stimulus was presented. And in both cases, even though there was a stimulation difference, there was uh, a similar performance. Subjects were equally good at detecting the stimulus. And yet they found a difference in how aware or how, how the percentage of judgments of having seen the stimulus uh, were. And they found, uh, they did these in the fMRI, uh, in, in the MRI scanner and the fMRI data showed uh, you know, a dorsolateral uh, prefrontal activity uh, pertaining to awareness when it was subtracted from the unaware trials. Now, I mean, if, if you know me, uh, you know that I might have a horse in this race, but not for this talk, but for this talk, I really don't care if it's PFC or any other uh, region. What I really care is about the methodological um, achievement of matching performance, which you know, as I've described before, it's very likely to match for other psychological variants of interest. Uh, Steve Fleming, uh, this is not fMRI, this is a patient study found uh, uh, patients with uh, frontal lesion, lesions uh, did a perceptual task and also a memory task, but I'm going to focus on the perceptual task, where, you know, Patients with prefrontal lesions here in white and, uh, sorry, um, here in red, and patients uh, with other types of lesions in blue and uh, neurotypical subjects in white, they all performed a task, a perceptual task, and they all did it more or less the same. And yet, the people with a lesion in prefrontal cortex 
couldn't uh, rate confidence equally well. They, their metacognitive awareness, their introspective awareness was impaired. And I think this is very important because you can show that whatever difference you find in your variable of interest, in this case, uh, introspective awareness, it didn't came from a problem processing the stimulus on one hand. And by matching the processing of the stimulus, you can also close to guarantee or at least increase the likelihood that you found uh, yeah, that other constructs, other mental constructs are matched, like attention and working memory and so on. So this can be done and it has been done and I think it's really important. But it has some limitations that, as I've been saying, go beyond consciousness. Uncertainty about the sociable processing uh, happens, right? There are uh, theoretical assumptions in what I just described. In the case of consciousness in particular, uh, not every theory of what consciousness is, thinks that you can separate consciousness and signal processing, for example. Uh, whereas what I just said kind of presumes that, uh, assumes that you can have high perceptual processing and variable degrees of awareness. So at least in this case, there might be theoretical assumptions that are problematic, and this could be true for any other psychological variable like memory or experiences of beauty. Uh, it won't be global workspace theory, but there will be some uh, theoretical limitations. Um, there are, um, another problem is the multidimensionality of the sociable processing. So performance is matched on probe tasks only, right? When I match for performances in the task that I'm doing, uh, I'm asking subjects to do, let's say, identify or discriminate the orientation of some gradings. But there are so many other things that subjects are doing when uh, doing that task that I'm not probing, right? Like detecting the presence of the stimulus, uh, estimating the precise orientation of the gradings, and so on and so forth. So we don't know if the task is matched along those unprobed tasks, and therefore we can't be sure that other psychological variables are matched. And I think that it's very, it's very likely that when doing these type of experiments, because you're trying to get stimuli as close as possible to each other, you won't get radical differences in the psychological variable of interest, in this case, consciousness. It's, it's possible that you get, in, on some trials, the stimulus is completely visible. In some trials, the stimulus is completely invisible. That's not impossible, but it's unlikely. So you might end up having to collect continuous measures, like more or less conscious uh, or visible stimuli, versus what you might think it's more interesting, which is the categorical measures, like whether you saw something or didn't see something. And at least for the case of consciousness, this is problematic because at least some people think that it really doesn't make sense even to talk about degrees of phenomenal consciousness. It, you either have it or not. And yet our experiments tend to make it a continuous measure, so that could raise some trouble. And finally, the most obvious of everything is you still have to have different stimulation, which of course creates some differences in the brain and therefore in the and this is what I want to focus on the very last minutes of the talk uh, as I introduce a triangulation approach. Uh, I, can't, I can't talk about every single aspect of these or solve every one of these limitations, but I want to talk about the difference in stimulation at least. Okay. So in the studies that I just described, we saw that there was different stimulation that was required for creating differences in uh, awareness. But even though there were some differences in this study, like many differences, there were different stimuli, there were different stimulations, there were uh, different patients or different subjects, and yet a kind of similar brain results were obtained. So this is probably good, right? Like it's probably good. Uh, there is strength in variation, like this is robust to error. Like if you try different ways and obtain the same results, you might think that you're onto something. And it might make your results more generalizable, right? Like it's not just about the metacontrast masking or it's not just about these patients. It's, it's in general, it seems like awareness. It's in this example, implemented a PFC. However, 
I think that neuroimaging results are hardly replicated in, in, in a way that it's important for science. On one hand, they're expensive, you know, um, and researchers might think that it's not worth uh, pursuing direct replications. There are many variations across testing sites, like different scanners, different conditions, different uh, uh, experiments, of course. And in the case of neuroimaging, in you know, in contrast to behavioral data, the, the neuroscientific data is quite multidimensional. There are lots of things that uh, you can be analyzing, and this creates an explosion of possible pipelines, which of course makes very hard to talk about replication because people will use extremely different uh, ways of analyzing the data, which of course exists for behavioral data as well. But this is this problem is just massively um, more complicated for neuroimaging, uh, creating lots of research secrets of freedom, some of which might be, uh, you know, not 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 unethical in any way or not against good practices. Just literally, you can do lots of things to analyze data. So when you when you go about having different labs making different experiments with different paradigms that never replicate each other. Uh, you end up with lots of uncertainty about what you've found. And this creates, of course, uncertainty in the literature and, and back and forth, theoretical back and forth of trying to interpret the data, but to some extent is uh, apple and oranges. Uh, and again, this is not to pick out like any researcher, or, uh, this is just a debate I happen to uh, be uh, kind of involved, but literally it's very hard to know if your results are valid uh, because, you know, not everyone finds them, but then it's very easy to say, like, well, you didn't find it because you didn't test the same way that I did the test and so on and so forth. The conditions weren't the same. And here's where triangulation approach comes in. Um, the idea is to combine the results from multiple experimental designs with disjoint sets of confounds. And what this means, uh, and as I've been saying, it's, it's a rather simple approach, but something that it's rarely done and that I think that we should pursue more. The idea is to maximally match stimulus conditions except for the confound, right? So try to have the same kind of stimuli. So if you're going to test for consciousness, just, just use noisy gratings throughout. Uh, just try to do the same task, let's say detection of the gratings. Same testing conditions, for example, try to use the same scanner or at least the same brand of scanner and the same protocols and so on. If possible, you might even do the same subjects, right? Like test different types of, um, uh, like very, very minimally what compound you're uh, relying on. Uh, and maybe you can do it on the same subject. So for once uh, in block one, you create a conscious unconscious uh, difference by um, making one of the contrasts more visible than the other, more, you know, more contrasty than the other. For another block, you present the, the stimulus, that, that same stimulus a little bit faster and, uh, than the other. In another block or in another session, uh, you might present, you know, the same task, except that you render the stimulus conscious and unconscious by uh, um, varying the type of mask that you use and so on and so forth. Um, this is just what I said, right? Like just, just try to vary the confound while keeping uh, everything else the same. And this has lots of advantages, I think, that uh, might be underappreciated. Uh, it gives you high control of uh, permutating the confounds, right? If everything is the same except for the confound, but you try them all at the same time, or you know, like success, uh, uh, you know, in different experiments run by the same uh, uh, team, then you can really have a control of what compounds you are introducing into your experiments. You can match the testing conditions. You can make sure that there are consistent analyses, making your uh, results more robust. And I think that one advantage is that this approach is better carried out by teams, like. You know, if you're going to do like several versions of the same experiment, changing minimally what confound you introduce, the this is probably something that is better done by several labs, and there is strength in collaboration, right? Like uh, you might you might be less biased, you might find 
you might you might go out for help and so on. Uh, and of course, there are limitations. For example, and this is a really important one, there might be unforeseen interactions of stimulus confounds. So the fact that you test for consciousness and unconsciousness in one case by making the contrast uh, more pronounced and in the other one, you change the mask. It doesn't mean that that's the only difference. There could be interactions of activating, you know, in the case of contrast, the stimulus becomes more salient, whereas in the mask, it doesn't. And that might interact with other types of uh, uh, mental or, or psychological variables. So it's not, it's not perfect. There are gonna be some interactions that even by triangulating, you can't uh, get rid of or even uh, predict. It's probably more expensive because you have to do the same experiment over and over again with minimal variations. In a way, there's some risk of failure that it's higher if you do just one experiment, right? Like if you do one experiment, you find some correlate, that's it, that's your correlate, you publish the paper. Whereas if you triangulate and you find out that, you know, the correlates are not the same or the results are very different, you might want to go back to the drawing board and you might miss out on a publication, for example. Um, and as I said before, it might be hard to run by a single lab, which, you know, it's problematic because you have to collaborate, you have to have more money and so on. I think that the first one is a theoretical, very interesting problem that we should think more about collectively. But the other two, the other three are social uh, limitations. And to be honest, I think they are limitations in the sense that, yeah, not people don't want to, everything else being equal, you don't want to spend more money, uh, you want to publish more papers and so on. But I think that these can be put on its, tail and its heads and actually they can become strength uh, like like a strength of our approach we can do a more social science in a way like where it's more based on teams rather than single labs and we can if we fail uh in terms of not finding the same correlates of consciousness I, or any other measure we actually have succeeded in a way right like we we succeeded in finding that the single task approach that we were using before was flawed because we probably are not zeroing into the right neural activity once we triangulate by changing very minimally all these uh, parameters. So I think there's lots, even though there, this, this could be thought as limitations, there are lots of advantages in doing uh, this kind of research. Okay, so that's the proposal. Uh, just to conclude, I'll sum up. Um, eliminating confounds is crucial in science, but in neuroscience, even more so, because it presents like particular challenges. It might be impossible to eliminate all confounds in a single experiment. Uh, there are no silver bullets. And to match psychological confounds, we should try a, a ripple effect approach where we find an important uh, behavioral measure that uh, it's likely to affect uh, all other psychological variables. In the case of consciousness, I brought up performance matching, but it could be different solutions for different types of constructs. Um, and to make up for limitations, we might try to narrow them. Uh, what uh, exactly confound effect we're doing. And this is where the triangulation approach comes in, which might be more demanding, but potentially more rewarding too, and might allow us to do uh, better science. So with that, I finish and I'm uh, thank you for your attention. Thank these guys for uh, their uh, the parts of the project that they uh, collaborate with. And I'm eager to have some discussion with you. Thank you.